Hey guys, welcome to my channel, Exam Tricks and Tips. This comprehensive series is designed to prepare you for the AWS Cloud Practitioner exam. The series is entirely free, so please subscribe to this channel as it encourages me to create quality course material in the subject area. Welcome to episode eight. We cover question number 51 to 55 in this episode. Let's get started. Question number 51, a company plans to use an Amazon Snowball Edge device to transfer files to the AWS Cloud. Which activities related to a Snowball Edge device are available to the company at no cost? We are introducing a new topic here, AWS Snowball. There's a whole Snow family of devices. We'll cover Snowball now, and probably in a shorter video, I'll cover the Snow devices as well. It's hardware storage device that AWS provides. You can order it from AWS. It is petabyte scale transportation service. It's rainproof, dustproof. It, as you can see, it also comes with label, address label, which is a e-ink display. Basically, it's a Kindle. Uh, embedded in the box and the address is automatically updated over there. Whatever you need to connect this box to your data center, you got everything in there. Uh, this is a screenshot of the ports on the box, uh, power cable, network ports, etc. So how to use it? You need to make requests to AWS to get this box uh, using your console. AWS will ship it to you and then you use uh, this box connected to your data center load your data, it will all be encrypted using KMS. AWS will pick it up via UPS or the courier company that you have in your area, in your region. The box goes back to AWS, then they load all of the data back into AWS infrastructure, most likely S3 buckets. So that's what it is. It's a, a very effective store service that AWS provides if you have to move on-premises uh, data into cloud. So let's go back to our question. What uh, highlight the keywords there? Uh, I have highlighted my keywords essentially snowball age but this particular service is asking uh, what do you get at no cost so the first option use of snowball age appliance for a tender period the suppliance is not free you have to pay for it it's a service uh, that uh, is uh, paid so this one is ruled out back to the question i've highlighted the keywords here it's a snowball age question so that is a keyword and what we have been asked here is what do you get out of the four options mentioned here at no cost so first one use of the Snowball Edge appliance for a 10-day period. There is no such period. It's not a free service. You have to pay for this service. So it's a wrong answer. Second option, the transfer of data out of Amazon S3 to Snowball Edge appliance. You all know, some tip we have gone through, any data transfer out of cloud is not free, whether it is for S3, whether it is for any other storage service, or it is for Snowball. Once data goes into Amazon S3, again, if you want that data back to do some sort of data upload in your environment, that service is not free. So this is a wrong answer as well for that reason. Third option, the transfer of data from Snowball Edge Appliance into Amazon S3. Now this, based on the same uh, exam tip, uh, data transfer into cloud is free. So you just need to remember it. And generally it is true for almost any service that is there. And even though this particular service, you know, Snowball is a specialized version of uh, data transfer, it applies there as well. Amazon would like data to come into cloud infrastructure so that you know, you use their service. And thereafter, if you are taking any part of the data out, it is chargeable. So obviously that discourages then customers not to take that out unless they need it for some sort of reference purpose. This particular uh, in policy or the strategy from Amazon is to make sure that people come in for free of cost with their data. And then because they're charged to move data out, they will use services of Amazon if whatever data manipulation they need to do with the data which they are thinking of taking out. So they basically stay within the overall AWS environment. The, there's no charge for this particular bit. You are charged for copying the data from on-prem onto the device, the usage of device transportation. But then finally, when the device gets to Amazon, uh, data transfer into S3 buckets is not chargeable because we, it, the cost is already covered. You're not going to charge customer three, four times for the same service. But specifically, this leg is being marked free because that encourages customers to get their data in because it's free. The last option, we got we got our answer already, uh, but let's look at the last option. Daily use of Snowball Edge Appliance after 10 days. I don't know what is this 10 days scenario. Uh, it's just a, uh, something there to mislead you. Uh, there's no free usage of this device, so this is a wrong answer. So we got our answer, option C. Let's look at uh, specific documentation which uh, highlights this part or reconfirms it. So here is the documentation from AWS related to AW, uh, Snowball pricing, and you can see that uh, transfer into Amazon S3, irrespective of region, uh, is free, is zero dollars. 
So that's that. Um, I I have also a couple of uh, pages from AWS documentation about AWS service, but we already covered uh, in detail in the earlier slide. Have you covered this as well, how it works, uh, exactly what I mentioned. You order the AWS Snowball, it gets shipped to you, you plug it in, data is written, and it goes back to AWS and it's written into AWS S3 buckets. So that's it on this question. Let's move to the next question. Question number 52, a company has deployed applications on Amazon EC2 instance. The company needs to assess application vulnerabilities and must identify infrastructure deployments that do not meet best practices. Now, this is a very easy question. We have covered similar questions uh, in previous episodes. And if you know the service by now, you, will, you would have guessed the answer. We will anyway go through the options. Uh, you can mark your keywords. Uh, pause the video if you like. I hope uh, you have marked your keywords. Uh, so essentially, we need a service that identifies vulnerabilities. So first one is AWS Trusted Advisor. We know it's an advisory service about security, reliability, performance uh, of your AWS infrastructure. It will tell if anything is not correct. It doesn't do any remedial action. You have to take remedial action. It doesn't look at vulnerabilities. So this is not a correct answer for me. Amazon Inspector. Now, the sole job of Amazon Inspector is to find vulnerabilities. And this is a correct answer. This is a correct answer for me. Amazon Inspector, we got one answer, but we'll go through other services because these might appear in the next uh, set of questions as well. So you're ready for it. AWS config, it's your config management service. It tells you what changes, uh, it tracks and records changes that must have happened to the AWS resources so that uh, you can uh, figure out if you have to go back to a previous version, etc. Uh, it doesn't specifically do anything related to vulnerabilities. So it's a wrong answer. Last one, Amazon Guard Duty. It's a detection service that monitors your AWS account for suspicious activity. So it's related to security area, but it's not specifically uh, related to vulnerability. So this is the wrong answer. So we got our answer. It's answer B, Amazon Inspector. If you need to assess application vulnerabilities, that's what you need. I do have a documentation around this, but I'm not going to go much into details. And uh, you will have links for all of this. I advise you to just go over uh, each of the services uh, based for what uh, is the you know primary usage of each Amazon Inspector, Guard Duty, Config, and Trusted Advisor. As I told you, I'm not going to go into detail. And uh, one of the important uh, tips from me, wherever you see a short video on each of the service, I highly recommend you to go through it. These are like two, three minutes videos. They're not long, but uh, they will give you a very uh, good idea of what each of the service is. So that's it on this question. We'll move to the next question. Question number 53, a company has a centralized group of users with large file storage requirements that have exceeded the space available on premises. The company wants to extend its file storage capability for this group while retaining the performance benefit for sharing content locally. Please read the question, go through the details, requirement, mark your keywords. I hope you have gone through the question. Now this is a solution architect associate style question. So this is what you will get when you move from AWS cloud practitioner to the next level, any sort of associate level. But typically uh, if you go to SA, which is Solution Architect Associate, you will get uh, these kind of questions. They'll be lengthier, uh, wordy. The options will also be lengthier. Now, this is a simpler SAA question. It's still an AWS Cloud Practitioner question and relates to one service, but it will give you a flavor of what to expect in Solution Architect Associate. Anyway, let's go through the options. First one, create an Amazon S3 bucket for each user, mount each bucket by using S3 file system mounting. Now, the problem here is, you have some sort of hybrid uh, cloud structure here. Uh, we have on-prem, you have resources in AWS, uh, and customer is uh, running out of the storage capacity on on-prem. Now, to be honest, once you know the service, it will come to you, but we'll go one by one. Uh, with respect to this option, S3 bucket, uh, this is not an operationally efficient because you'll have to create an S3 bucket for each of the user and the whole management of it, it's not operationally efficient. In cloud world, this is a very standard requirement and there will be a out of the box service. And that's another example for you. If AWS has a service, then you have to make use of it. You don't have to go round and about to uh, create a solution because the whole point AWS wants from uh, you is to make an efficient use of services that you have. And they have tried to create services for almost each and every scenario. And this is a scenario that would happen quite often if you're having a hybrid cloud situation. So this is a wrong answer for me. Uh, it's not operationally efficient and we do need an operationally efficient question. And even if this was not mentioned, I wouldn't go for this anyway. Second option, configure and deploy AWS storage gateway. 
Now, this is the service made for exact use case that we have here. If you have any sort of, uh, if you want to basically extend your on-prem storage capacity, you need to use storage gateway. Option B, configure and deploy AWS storage get, uh, gateway. So this is the service that AWS has created for exact use case for extending um, on-prem storage capacity. Uh, it provides the best balance of performance and operational efficiency. The file gateway will cache frequently access data locally as well, which will improve the performance for users so you don't have to uh, fetch the data from the disk uh, again and again if it's a frequently used uh, data a piece of data. This is a complete managed service. AWS will handle uh, the provisioning and maintenance of this infrastructure. So this is the correct answer. Let's go through other options as well. Option C, move each user's working environment to Amazon Workspaces, set up an Amazon Work Doc account for each user. Now, this is not a correct option because it's it is not going to give you uh, the same level of performance as file gateway. Plus, there will be operational overhead as well to set up uh, workspace for each of them. You are basically here solving a uh, problem by user by user, not for the whole organization. Gateway will basically eliminate the root cause, infinite amount of uh, storage space and solve it for uh, once and for all. So it's a wrong answer for me, this one. The last one is uh, deploy an Amazon EC2 instance and attach Amazon EBS uh, provision IO solution. It's very expensive and it's going to be difficult to manage. Amazon has created a service for exact uh, use case that we have, which is the storage gateway, and we'll use that. And that's the answer for this question. Answer B, AWS storage file gateway. Some tip is if you have to extend on-prem storage, just uh, go for storage gateway as your uh, answer from the options. In terms of uh, documentation, we do have some documentation around AWS storage gateway. You can go through it uh, to see what, what is the purpose of it. And you can see it provides an on-premise application with uh, access to virtually unlimited data storage. It's a highly performant, low latency, uh, usual performance benefit that you get with an AWS server. There is a video on this page as well. And you'll get the links for all of this in video description. You could go through that uh, video to get an idea of how uh, storage gateway works. That's it on this question. Let's move to the next question. Question number 54, according to security best practices, how should an Amazon EC2 instance be given access to an Amazon S3 bucket? Please read the question, go through the answers, uh, mark the requirement. I hope you read the question. Here are the keywords. We need uh, Amazon EC2 instance to access S3 buckets. So that's the, that's the problem definition here. Let's go through the options. The first option says, Hard code and I am user secret key. The moment you see hard code, it's never going to happen. Not cloud, not anywhere in the world. It's a wrong, wrong answer. It is the least secure option. You're not going to hard code uh, any credentials. So that's wrong. Second, store uh, user secret key and access key in a text file. Again, we are not storing any keys anywhere. It's against security practices. Uh, whether it's again AWS cloud or otherwise, this will never be recommended. So it's incorrect. The third one is have the EC2 instance assume a role to obtain privilege to upload the file. And this is the perfect answer for me. Any sort of access you want to do, you have to go through IAM policies and uh, this is the right way of accessing. This is the most secure option to have EC2 instance assume a role to obtain the privilege to upload the file. This option is considered more secure because it does not require exposure of IAM credential to EC2 instance. Next, so we got our answer, but let's uh, look at why these uh, not the right answer. So modify S3 bucket policy so that any service can upload at any point in time. Again, very insecure. If if we allow this, then any unauthorized users and services can upload the files to the bucket. We don't want this. And uh, there are multiple exam tips here. Basically, you know, principle of least privileges, uh, just give minimal access. Do not give anything more than a user or a service needs. See is the right answer. I will show you notation around this use case. Uh, and you will have the links for all of this later on uh, in the video description. So you can see uh, this is exactly what we are doing uh, for granting Amazon EC2 instance access uh, to an S3 bucket. And if you go through the details, we'll find how it is done. But from the question perspective, we just need to know uh, which of the four options we had. And this is one of the four options, which was option C. That's it on this question. Let's move to the next question. Question number 55, which option is a customer responsibility? when using uh, Amazon DynamoDB under the shared responsibility model. Now, uh, please read the question. This is not a long question. Mark your keywords. 
I hope you have done it. Uh, essentially, we need to know customer responsibility uh, for managing Amazon DynamoDB uh, based on the shared responsibility model. We have covered similar questions. Now, most important point here on top of whatever we've done with shared responsibility model earlier is this is a managed service. So infrastructure will be managed by infrastructure and the application of the DynamoDB patching, uh, physical security, everything will be managed by AWS and customer responsibility will be mostly around application. So let's look at uh, how it's going to work. Uh, let's go option by option. So first one, physical security. We have done this multiple times. Uh, it's not security. Or, uh, it's not uh, physical security. Is not responsibility of customer. Uh, it is. Uh, it's part of the data center responsibility, and uh, AWS will manage that. So this is the wrong answer. You probably know by this now. That's ruled out. Patching over time, DynamoDB. Now it's a managed application. Customers are not required to do it. AWS will manage it. So patching over time, DynamoDB is ruled out as well. So that's a wrong answer. Option C and D are a bit tricky. Uh, but yeah, let's go one by one. So access to DynamoDB. Now DynamoDB tables are controlled by IAM roles and policies. And customer are, customers are responsible for configuring this control. But uh, it is essentially controlled by IAM roles and policies. So this is not a customer responsibility from access perspective. So this is gone. Last option, encryption of data at rest in DynamoDB. Now, this is what customer's prime responsibility will be. Customers are responsible for securing their data at rest in DynamoDB. This includes encryption to protect the data from unauthorized access. AWS provides encryption for dynam options for DynamoDB, but customers are responsible for configuration, configuring and managing these options. This is this question is a bit of a bait question in terms of option C and option D, but uh, option D is the more appropriate answer. So we'll go with option D uh, for this question. And I will show you some documentation. So DynamoDB uh, encryption at rest, uh, as you can see for encryption, it's done using customer managed key. And that's where the customer's roles comes into picture. I do have uh, documentation around allowing accesses to tables as well. You can go through it. It doesn't really make a big point uh, to support our answers, but yeah, it will give you some context. So that's it on this question. I believe that was the last question in this episode. That brings us to the end of this episode. I'll see you in the next episode of this series soon. If you enjoy this content and want to stay updated on future episodes, then please subscribe to this channel. Your support motivates me to continue producing high quality content in this area. Thank you for watching. See you soon in the next episode of this series. Thank you.